Good morning. Welcome to week two of Ripple Effect, which is really our deep dive this summer into Hebrews chapter 11, which is also known as the Hall of Faith. It's an amazing account of men and women whose lives and decisions made out of faith have impacted us. It ripples even today to those of us in this room. And this morning, we get to focus in on Gideon. So you can open your Bible or open in your app and find Hebrews chapter 11. Gideon's bit comes in verses 32 through 34. And he really is a fascinating guy, um, a very unlikely hero, and someone that I'm sure we can easily relate to in some ways. But if you want to read along with me, Hebrews 11, 32 through 34 says this. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. This list of men are the warriors that we find in Hebrews chapter 11, that they were given the task and the ability to do these incredible things, to escape the edge of the sword and then rescue their nation from destruction. But hidden in there is a really interesting phase, phrase that their weakness was turned to strength, and that is for sure the case with Gideon. Before we take off on his life, I want to back up and hit Hebrews 11 chapter 1 or ch chapter 11, verse 1, and it's really the touchstone where the rest of the chapter takes off from. And as you look at Hebrews 11, 1, I want to put a concept in your mind. Um, I love this term, mom goggles. Raise your hand if you've heard this term yet. Okay, if not, here's what the official definition for mom goggles is. Mom goggles cloud the wearer's vision making their child look absolutely perfect in her eyes. Works with looks, intelligence, and skills. Now, you may not think this is a real thing, and I'm not sure every mom gets issued these goggles, or they only wear them with certain kids. You know what I mean? But in my own life, I found it to be true that when these beautiful little babies were born to me, they looked kind of rough, but in my eyes, they were perfect. And that carries on till today in many ways. But when I was 22 years old, I couldn't quite imagine this. My husband Steve and I had just launched out into life and ministry together, and the church we were serving at had an amazing administrative assistant named Tammy. And I loved Tammy. I had zero kids, but she had three boys. And at that time, she was in her 30s, probably close to the age I am now, and I watched her with her three boys. And all of the fun and craziness and love she had for them but there was one thing I could not fathom or understand. Their family was a baseball family. Do we have any baseball families in this room? Oh my goodness, it's like your whole life. And she loved it. I mean, you gotta take your kids to practice during the week, and with three boys, that's times three. And then on Saturdays, sometimes on Sundays, you have games, you have tournaments. And Tammy genuinely loved this. I would watch her schedule for the weekends of what, going to observe these baseball games and think there are fates worse than death. <laughs> I'm like, you can pay me enough to sit and watch little kids sports all weekend, but she genuinely loved it. And then, fast forward, I had my own boys. And I find myself getting up early on Saturday mornings to watch basketball and soccer and baseball, and I love it. I'm so excited to be there because they're my kids. And I put my mom goggles on and I'm cheering. I'm so excited for every soccer goal they make or every attempted shot. It doesn't matter what it is. I see them hustling and I think they are just the most wonderful, talented, amazing kids. So I get those mom goggles fixed on and I have a great time on Saturdays. The only way that happens though is through that view of my own kids who I love so much. And really, that's true for us in general in life that we're all viewing the things around us through lenses, different kinds and different views of the same incident can happen with different people, that we view life through a lens. And the writer of Hebrews is touching on that idea in chapter 11, verse 1. This is a very famous verse, and it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. 
faith, man, it's what allows us to believe. It's what allows us to keep going when we just have hope and be absolutely certain that things that we can't see exist. But verses like this sometimes get turned into the idea of, man, it's just a leap of faith. It's blind faith. Close your eyes and go for it. And for some people, that seems easy. They jump in both feet with Jesus and keep running after him, just so excited to be part of his family. But for others, it's a struggle. I have a friend who I love dearly and have known most of my life. He grew up hearing the same things I heard at church with parents who were teaching him the Bible, read Hebrews chapter 11, I'm sure. But as an adult, confusion on this concept of faith kind of set in. And he wondered, what do I really believe? I've heard this my whole life, but do I believe it? I kind of want to believe it, but how do we know this is true? There are people all over the world who believe different things in the arena of spirituality. And he's a pretty mild-mannered, easygoing guy, but the couple of times in our adult life that we've had conversations about faith, he gets to the point where I can hear a little bit of a shake in his voice and something in his eyes. There is a battle going on inside where he wonders, and he said to me one time, I want to believe, but can't I have some more proof? I think my response was along the lines of some proof, but yeah, you got to have faith. It takes faith. You'll never see it all. And he answered with that little shake and passion, but I, I need some proof. Isn't there more proof? And some of us in this room absolutely understand what he's saying and have been there. That might be you this morning, that you're willing to entertain the idea of who is God, who made this world. I can't deny that there is a force at work, but I need a little more proof. And even those of us who have been following Jesus for a long time and put our faith in him sometimes go through really confusing seasons. Tell me if any of these questions resonate with you. God, I want to believe in you, but how do I know, really know what's true? Can't I have some more proof? Or maybe, as a follower of Christ, did God really speak to me, or am I making all of this up? I believed for a miracle, and it did not happen. How can I trust God again? Or, this is a toughie, but so true. I've been a believer for years, but if I'm honest, sometimes I doubt that God will really come through or that he's even there at all. Hard to admit that many of us in this room could say, I have wrestled or I'm wrestling today with doubts, not so sure about who I am and not so sure of who God is. And if that's you, then you're going to love Gideon because he's a very unlikely hero, and yet he is counted as one of the great men of faith. And we say to people, it's a leap of blind faith. Go for it. And that works for some, but not for others. Let me submit to you this morning that faith isn't blind, it's fixed. It's focused. Faith isn't blind, it's focused. You don't close your eyes and pretend you can't see everything around you. You focus on what matters. And this happens through God's strength and spirit. And it happened for Gideon. I invite you to look, if you want, at Judges chapter 6. This is where we find fleshed out the life, the story of Gideon. He was born into a crazy time in the history of Israel, a cycle that was on repeat over and over again. And we get a hint of this in Judges chapter 6, verse 1. It says this, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Look at that first part again. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Gideon was born into a society with a problem. You and I might call it sexual addiction, breakdown of the family, political corruption, racial tension. Does that sound familiar? This was the world of Israel. They would start off obeying God and then find themselves in a mess. The writer of Judges said it this way in chapter 21, verse 25. says that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Everyone did as they saw fit. 
Can I say this morning that you may not have mom goggles, but every single one of us have a nice set of sin goggles. <laughs> we all have sin goggles. We put on this lens through which we view the world, much like the Israelites, and end up doing things we never thought we would do. Things that are revolting and disgusting through the lens of sin start to look appetizing. Words we thought we'd never say to hurt somebody else just seem to make sense when we've got the sin goggles on. That we think it's right in our own eyes and our justification lets us say it. The lifestyle, the choices of someone else that are detrimental, that go against God, sometimes we give them a pass with our sin goggles thinking, but it makes most sense to me not to say anything because it might hurt them or make them angry. We all have a nice set of sin goggles and we pop them on and the Israelites did this over and over again. But before we're too hard on their nation, it's the story of humanity. We all do this over and over. And when Gideon comes onto the scene, he finds himself right in a certain spot of the cycle the Israelites repeated. They would go from obedience to God to rebellion, doing whatever was right in their own eyes, and then back to repentance. And Gideon comes right at the end of a long season of rebellion. And if you remember, it said that God had allowed their natural consequences to come upon them. After years and years of sin, the Midianites came and invaded their land, and they were there for seven years. Seven years. God knows that sin leads to consequences. It's painful, it hurts, whether it's yours or someone else's. But this is a long season. It took a long time for them to finally wake up and say, God, I need you. They'd been doing things that were hurtful. They were entrenched in greed. They stole from each other. They committed vile sexual acts with and against each other. And here they are finally saying, God, we need you. I think it took so long because rebellion must be surrounded by thick walls of pride to flourish in the human heart. How does it make sense any other way? Those of us here on planet Earth who are so small in comparison to God can find ways to pop those sin goggles on, look around, and think that we know better than Him. But how can we perpetuate that? It makes no sense. And it's that thickening pride that tells me I'm okay. I can keep doing it the same way because I'm so important and I know what's best. You don't have to look any further than Adam and Eve to realize this is the human condition, that they did what they thought was best, propped themselves up with pride, thinking they knew better than God, and it's what we could do and it's what the Israelites had done. So God would allow those natural consequences to mount up until they broke through the thick walls of pride and people realized I don't have it all together. I can't fix this. God, help me. Well, Gideon was a young man when the natural consequences came for his generation. And in Judges 6, 2 through 6, we see that the Midianites were brutal. They would show up every year at harvest time with one goal, just to take anything they could from the Israelites. They would go into their crops that they wanted to harvest, take what they wanted, destroy everything else, find the wheat, find the barley, find the leeks, and just trample them so that the Israelites would be left with nothing. Then they would kill every single animal. If you saved one and hid it the year before, they would find that one and kill it, leaving them with almost no food, then take off laughing as they returned to their country. And this was on repeat for seven years. So we find Gideon learning how to hide, learning how to survive in a horrible time in Israel's history, but also with some deep strength. His family was not immune to these problems, and we meet him there in chapter six, hiding in a wine press. Now this was a dip in the ground where you could trample grapes and then the wine would, the juice would run out and be able to be turned into wine. It was not the ideal conditions for what he was doing, but it was the only safe place. He had learned that if his family was going to eat, they needed the wheat stalks and they had to get the grain out of it. And the old way of doing this was a huge party. It was harvest time, they would go to the threshing floor and they would lay out their grains, their stalks of grain. They would have cattle pull a farming tool around and shake loose the wheat and the chaff and it would all blow up in the wind, blowing the bad stuff away and keeping what was edible. That's not what Gideon's doing. He's hiding 
crouched down in a dip. He has a tool that they had learned and fastened together, two boards with some rocks attached to it. He's quietly knocking each individual stalk of grain because he knows his family's life depends on this. If they're going to have anything to eat, he cannot be caught. So he listens with one ear while he quietly knocks loose every little bit of grain he can find and gather just so his mom and his dad, his brothers, his sisters can stay alive for another day. And it's there in this place that his life changes forever, that the ripples from that moment affect us even today. But he's been hiding and cowering and avoiding these Midianites for seven years. By this point, who he is has been affected. And after seven years of torment, he and everyone else is ready for repentance. But can I tell you that suffering the consequences of your own sin or somebody else's for a long season is so difficult. It's painful. But sometimes it's exactly what breaks through the rebellious hearts that we have and the pride that surrounds it so we can finally be humble before God. Humility and hard work make for great use of the glory of God. Gideon is finally humbled. He's a big, strong guy, bent down, hiding, doing this hard work. He's humble, he's working hard, and God shows up. For us, that can look like working our nine to five job. Doesn't seem like it's spectacular, but we're humble enough to do the job that pays the bills, and we do it day after day. For those of you with young kids, it's washing dishes, washing clothes, and changing diapers over and over and over again. Nothing humbles you quite like that. But there in those hard and humble moments, God shows up and does things in us that are incredible, teaching us lessons we wouldn't know otherwise. For many of us, it's sitting in classes and studying for exams and showing up again, and there in that place, God may speak to you or send you somebody you never expected much like Gideon. You know, I said faith isn't blind, it's focused. And that's so true. Gideon could see everything going on around him. He wasn't ignoring the, the issue of the Midianites or the past sin that they had been living in, but he's just working hard. He's focused on the one thing that he knows to that point he should do, and that's to quietly take care of his family. But what's funny about Gideon is that the more we get to know him, he does not become a really obvious choice for the man that would be a mighty warrior and go on to lead the Israelites to victory over Midian. Like so many characters in Hebrews' hall of faith, he's an underdog, total underdog, which makes him pretty lovable. And it reminds me that if we have sin goggles, God must have grace vision. The way he sees us is amazing. If I need mom goggles to be excited about basketball at 8 a.m. on a Saturday, then imagine what God needs when he looks at me. And God cannot kind of squint and turn away from all the wrong I do. He doesn't just close his eyes and pretend that the sin I've committed isn't real. He sees it because he's righteous and holy and perfect. He cannot look away from it. So he looks at you and he looks at me and he sees exactly who we are and exactly what we've done and he says, yep, I can use them. Isn't that amazing? That's the grace of God, that he looks at you and he sees in you what you have no clue is even there. And that's just like Gideon. Gideon's such an underdog, but the good news is God operates exclusively through underdogs. Think about it, it's his only option. He created humanity and we've got, we are what he's got to work with. I mean, we humans are the ones that bomb each other for oil, try to not make eye contact with our neighbors sometimes, and waste our time on the internet, right? This is who God has to work with. We are all the underdogs before we think we're so great. And yet God looks at us and he loves to use us, just like he loved using Gideon. And I think we kind of like this, if we're honest. We all love a good underdog story. And it made me think about here in our country, the fascination with this idea. And for the last like 15 years, we've had reality show after show that has this concept at the heart. American Idol, America's Got Talent, The Voice, and on and on. The idea is that sitting in this room, 
is somebody who is so amazingly talented that nobody's ever seen it, but if they're just given the chance, their influence is going to skyrocket. And a great example of that is Susan Boyle. Do you remember her? I didn't even watch America's Got Talent, but the video started showing up all over the internet, and I remember watching her on her first performance. Now, this is a woman from Great Britain who was just humble and working hard, and somebody talked her into showing up and singing. But I stood on that stage, looking as ordinary as you or I, she began to sing, and her voice was incredible, and the whole world freaked out about how amazing she was as a singer. You couldn't know it just from looking at her. Of course not. It was a gift on the inside. And that is how God sees you and me. Maybe nobody else knows it. Maybe I don't even know it. But God sees in me exactly what he wants to use, and he's excited about it. So back to the wine press. Gideon's there, hunched over, drenched with sweat, a little bit afraid, and working hard. When God shows up, he's startled by a voice. Judges 6.12 begins their discussion. It's an angel, and the angel says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So just think about that. Gideon's hiding, he's doing his work, his back probably hurts, he's down on his knees, and then his head snaps as he hears this. He doesn't know who this guy is. He didn't even notice him sitting under a tree, and suddenly he's being addressed. And we don't know if he, in that moment, knew it was an angel or not, but I'm sure as he heard that voice, his muscles tensed, and he was ready for a fight. Then he looks at the guy, and he says this. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, and I can just hear his voice dripping with sarcasm. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. This is a bold move. He's not sure who this guy is, but he's saying what everybody else in Israel is thinking. If God is with me, then what's this all about? And you're calling me a mighty warrior? Gideon doesn't even acknowledge that part. God has shown up, and Gideon is being honest with him. Judges 6.14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And there it is again, go in the strength you have. I picture Gideon with his tool in his hand, looking at this guy like, <laughs> I be warrior, go in the strength that I have, and I'm going to deliver the whole country. His mind had to be racing, but he began to understand that this was not an ordinary conversation. So all of us are excited to know what God thinks of us, to focus on who he says I am instead of my own swirling thoughts or the things I've heard. But when the rubber meets the road and he asks us to do something with that, whew, sometimes we feel like Gideon. He says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Look, Gideon is a good guy. He's willing to stay in the wine press and work hard so his family can survive another day. But he's smart enough to realize that he has grown up and lived his whole life around men who were much tougher, much stronger, and in his mind, much better than him. What mighty warrior that God says he is is not how he sees himself. Look at his words. This is what God says. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. You know, I understand that long seasons of pain leave marks on our soul. Ask me how I know. I know. And like Gideon, after seven years of being beaten down and hiding, there was a lot of insecurity and a lot of fear that had been left in his heart. But here's the good news. Those years can kind of widen the cracks in our heart and allow God's truth to pierce. And I want to say this morning that God sees in you so much just like he did in Gideon. He is so proud of you for being here this morning. 
Some of you may have, may have had a big fight on the way here just to make it here. Ask me how I know that, too. <laughs> Although we drove separately today, so not today. Other days. Just getting here is a big deal, and God is so pleased with that sacrifice. He's excited even when we're beating ourselves up for whatever happened on the way. God sees you, and when we sometimes think the worst about ourselves, I think that puts us in a category where we get to be in the background, here's what God's thinking about us instead, something like this. God looks at you and he may say, I rescued him from such a dysfunctional family. He has deep strength now. He may look at you and say, she is ready to lead now. I'll cover the things she thinks she's lacks. I'm calling her to lead now. He may look at you and say, with his past mistakes that he's made, with them being forgiven, he is the perfect person to rescue others. He may look at you and say, he's not too young to serve. He's got his whole life ahead of him, and I will give him the wisdom he needs as he obeys. Or he may look at you and say, she's not too old to serve. Her total trust in me is going to set captives free. We look at ourselves as labeled and tired, and God looks at us as in the exact place he wants us. Humble, working hard so he can show up and do what he needs to. The changes a sustained trial bring to your temperament, to your personality, to the way you think, it may have rendered you as an underdog, feeling like you've lost your faith, whew, or you don't have much. But remember, get ready, God operates exclusively through underdogs, exclusively. He cannot wait to work in your life. And faith isn't blind, it's focused. God sees everything you've been through, and he knows exactly how he wants to use you. And this is the way he hopes you begin to see, that you can look at your past, but with focused vision, begin to head in the direction that he wants to take you. God sees us perfectly, but we need his help to focus on what matters. Now, here's where the story gets fun. The rest of Judges chapter six, seven, and eight show us how Gideon goes on to be used by God to accomplish this victory. And it was intense, it was tough, and it stretched him. Four different times, Gideon comes back to God and says, okay, I said I would do this, but is this really you? He didn't just charge ahead and never worry again. He would come back four different times. One time when God was ready to send him out to battle, he said, okay, so I'm going to do this, God. I'll take this sheep's wool and leave it out all night. When I wake up, if it's dry and the grass is wet, that means you've really told me to do this. So he woke up, and that's exactly what happened. He ran off and did what God said then, right? No. So he, I think in his mind he's like, oh, man, <laughs> maybe God really does want me to do this. So he tried it again. He said, okay, God, um, let's do the opposite. How about I wake up and the grass is totally, totally dry and the, the sheep's wool is soaking wet. So then the, he does it, asks for it that way. God does that for him. He can't get around it any further. And he does something like this four separate times. Let me encourage you that fearful obedience is still obedience. It still counts, and God is excited about it. You can do what God's asked you to do, shaking in your boots, and he is cheering you on. That just like Gideon, he asks us for his obedience, but he doesn't leave us alone to do it. Now, my mom was just here to visit not too long ago, and I'm thankful that to this point, I do not yet need glasses. But my mom can drive without glasses. She can do most of life without glasses. But when it's time to read now, it's kind of blurry. And how does it feel when you try to read and everything's blurry? You're moving the book, eventually you get a headache, and you might just close it and say, forget it. So my mom has reading glasses that she hides all over, like on every level of my house, so they're in close reach. And I find them even after she leaves sometimes, <laughs> those little readers that she can pop on and actually see what she needs to in a book. And this is the idea that we're talking about with faith this morning. That as believers, we need corrective faith lenses. We need help. We see everything around us, oh, and sometimes it's a little overwhelming. And those lenses of faith help us to focus on what God wants us to look at. For Gideon, the rubber kind of meets the road. And in Judges 6, 33 through 34, it tells us about the Midianites. 
It says, after Gideon had agreed to obey, it says, then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves, and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and the Abizrites were called together to follow him. In chapter 7, we find out that there were so many in this army of Midian and their allies. There were so many of them that the valley looked like it was full of locusts. And they even brought so many camels that the camels looked like grains of sand. It was a huge, formidable army. And once again, Gideon can see the army. God did not make it disappear. He saw what he was up against. It wasn't blind, but then God focused him time and time again on exactly who was going to win and fight this battle. So Gideon gets to start out with an army of 32,000 men up against the thousands out in that valley. And then God says, no, too many. He shrinks his army to 10,000. Gideon's probably feeling a little nervous, but he's willing to keep going. And then God shrinks it down to 300. 300 men versus a vast army. And Gideon is willing to go for it with 300 men. Because God had made it clear that he knew too well the cycle of the Israelites and those huge walls of pride that they easily build up. And he said, no, no, no. If you do this with 32,000 men, you're going to think you did it yourself. So I've got to bring it to the point where no one can deny what is going to happen. So those 300 men and Gideon move forward with focused faith. God confirms again that he's going to destroy the Midians, and they move forward with their corrective lenses of faith on, and they begin to head toward the Midianites. You know, a very interesting part of what we read in Judges 6, 33 and 34 is the one line where it says, so the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. God does not ask us to face whatever's ahead of us on our own. You may have a broken marriage. You may be up against a long season of financial struggle. There may be stuff in your past family that you still have to deal with every time a holiday comes around and in between. There can be long seasons of struggle. And yet, God does not leave us to just do it on our own. With eyes of faith fixed on him, he fills us with his spirit and sends us out to do what's necessary. One of my favorite authors says it this way. Mark Batterson says, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call. That God doesn't wait until you are the perfect person. He picks you because he knows what you can do if he puts his spirit inside of you. And that's incredible for me, for you, for Gideon. So Gideon marches out and Judges 7 verses 21 and 22 tell us how the battle ends. It says it this way, while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords, and the army fled. God was never going to expect 300 men to kill all of those Midianites. God was going to make it happen. And he did something through his spirit that the ripple effects were felt for years in Israel, that the 300 men who watched that valley, who watched those men run in chaos and turn on each other, knew that it was God at work. And they could tell their children and their grandchildren on till today. That the ripple effects of Gideon and his men's faith were powerful. And that's true in our lives too. But let me tell you, we have something that Gideon did not. Truthfully, after the dust settled and the Midianites were gone, Israel did get to experience years of peace and better obedience toward God. But Gideon's a complicated guy. And if you have time later to read chapter 8, chapter 9, you'll see that he has some real character flaws. And although he had had a moment of the Spirit of the Lord coming on him, and he had had a time of laser-focused faith, he eventually reverted back to those old sin goggles. His life was full of power, sexual addiction that ended up ruining his family. He had 70 sons plus one. 
and the one ended up killing all the rest. That's kind of a bummer. I would love for Gideon to just be like the best grandpa of all time, and all of his children followed God after that. But this is the real world, and the Hebrews, and the author of Hebrews understood what Gideon was dealing with, with those sin goggles back on and doing his best to obey God. Things were still really, really hard for him. And we have such a gift that he would have loved to have had. If you look back to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, it says this. These, all the people that are listed in that chapter, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God has planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Abraham and Noah, Gideon, every man, every woman listed in that hall of faith, they did great things. Their acts of faith changed their nation, changed the world, their stories inspire us, but they needed what we have. And together, now we look back and see the picture of what God was leading toward. The Hebrews author goes on in chapter 12 to say it this way. This is the glorious good news of what we've got. It says that, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The Bible says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, Gideon being one of them. And somehow their stories of faith and their relation with, relationship with God and their existence with him for eternity, in some way we are surrounded by this and they are cheering us on. And if we could hear the voice of Gideon this morning, I think this is what he would be saying to us. He would say, oh my goodness, you've got it so good. Your family doesn't have to end up the way mine did. The power and the strength and the spirit of God came on me one time, but you have Jesus. If you can fix your eyes on Jesus, it's gonna make all the difference. I didn't know what to do when I got back home. You can pray, you can talk to Jesus. I didn't know how to make the right choices when I was from a family that worshiped idols. I slipped back into it, but you don't have to. He would be cheering you on this morning saying, good for you for showing up today. And good for you seeking God with all your heart. I think he would say to us, Think about the cross. I didn't know a thing about it. You do. Think about the cross. I felt so ashamed of my mistakes and my weakness, but you don't have to feel ashamed because you know Jesus has paid the price. Gideon is cheering us on this morning, and he's encouraging us like the author of Hebrews to fix our eyes on Jesus. You know, I've said it quite a few times that faith is not blind, it's focused. And the author of Hebrews says right here, it should be focused on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And here's how I've learned to do this and continue to learn in my life. When I get worried, confused, distracted, led astray in sin, I realize that I, I've lost my focus on Jesus. And some of the ways I've found to bring that back around is one, to think about the cross. When it's done in a good way, a lot of Christians will just have a cross in their home, wear a cross on a necklace, and the sight of it will remind them about what Jesus did. And there have been times in the middle of the week that I've walked through this room and no one's here, and that cross will catch my eye, and I just have to sit down and think about who Jesus is and talk to him for a minute. There have been other times that I've been so busy in life and, and teaching about God and, and teaching kids about Jesus, and I've kind of forgotten exactly who he is. So I go back and read the Gospels again. And remember, what did Jesus really say? And what was he like? And how did he act? And fall in love with Jesus all over again. I think an amazing way to fix our eyes on him is to sing a new worship song like we did this morning. To sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies and make it, let it make you think because it's new. 
about what those words really mean, or to sing an old song of worship and remember what you were going through at that time and where God has brought you. The last thing I'll leave you with is just like Gideon, when you don't know what else to do and you feel like you've got the sin goggles on or you've lost your focus, you've forgotten how God sees you and you wanna get those faith glasses back on, corrective lenses, is just to do what Gideon did. When you don't know what else to do, be humble and work hard and then wait for God to show up. It's gonna blow you away when he does. So this morning I'd like to end with prayer and just ask God to work in our hearts, to speak into our lives individually because he knows exactly what you've carried in here this morning. He knows the things that you are rejoicing about and the ways he's boosted your faith so that you can go out, spread the good news of Jesus, tell the truth, do the right thing. He also knows the heavy burdens you may be carrying as a result of your sin or somebody else's. For some of us, we may think this morning, oh man, yeah, I know I have sin goggles. You don't know what I did last night and I didn't know if it was even okay for me to be here. But God sees you. And this idea of fixing your eyes on Jesus is what he wants for you too. Because as you do, you realize that he paid the price for that action, that he wants to give you a new life in him, and he has great forgiveness. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that even in the Old Testament, we see the glimpses of what was going to be the present reality today. Father, I thank you that your spirit dwells in the heart of every believer in this room. And God, may we become more aware of that, that we've got everything we need to obey you. Lord, I just pray over the broken places and hearts, the wounds and the long seasons that some people have found themselves in of pain. And God, we put our faith and trust in you renewed again, thanking you that you're really enough. Your forgiveness at the cross is really enough. If you never did another thing, it's enough. But Lord, we thank you that you choose to use us as well. And God, as just one big bunch of underdogs this morning, we thank you for looking at us and seeing what we can't see on our own. Jesus, I thank you for every man, woman, every student, every child here this morning. I pray that our eyes would be ready, focused on you as you prepare to show up in our life and send us out on your mission. In Jesus' name, amen.